It's time to see how the transmission is assembled, which is also my final inspection to make sure everything is where I want it prior to welding it all up. You'll see why this is important later in this chapter. Over here on the tool and parts area of the bench is the motor assembled onto the motor bracket, the chipper shredder rotor, and the drive shaft. To the left in my working area is the transmission bracket which already has the main bearing, drive shaft support bearing, and chipper rear housing plate mounted. Also shown are two reinforcing gussets that need to be welded as well as the motor mount clamped in place. Now I'll get the camera mounted on a tripod so it's not so shaky and we'll see how it all goes together. The first thing I do is assemble the drive shaft to the rotor along with the 3 16 key. I already have the shim in place inside the bearing and now to install the rotor axle assembly, first sliding the pulley on and then the two belts, but once again this dumbass did not realize it was blocking the camera. Do you remember how difficult it was to install the shim while on the bench in the last video? You'll see here it goes on relatively easily while it is on the assembly. All I have to do is hold the shim so it does not get pushed out the other side. Once the drive shaft and rotor assembly is installed, then I put on the drive shaft clamp collar that sets the depth of the rotor. Installing another key and then sliding the pulley in place. Later I will find that the pulley collar needs to be on the other side to better align with the motor pulley. Dropping the motor onto the motor mount and then the belts onto the pulley. I had to change the spacing of the motor mount to enable easier installation of the belts. This is the point of this preliminary assembly to identify issues and where parts should be located before welding. And now here is a nice view of my back. Once everything is in place, a couple of turns on the rotor and discovered a couple of more changes needed. One of the motor mounting screws could come in contact with the inner belt so it will have to be changed to a countersunk screw. I also realized that there is nothing holding the drive shaft assembly in place. I have a collar stopping the rotor from going in too far but there is nothing stopping it from coming out. Now for my design change. As I had stated, there was nothing holding the drive shaft in the transmission. On the rotor side, there is this screw holding the rotor on the drive shaft, pushing against this collar, which will eventually be welded to the shaft. Then the drive shaft rotor assembly slides into the rear bearing, and there is nothing preventing it from coming back out. Whoops! Here you can see I cut a large slot out of the rear flange and have bored and tapped another hole into the drive shaft but this time is for a 3 8 screw. I measured the gap from the end of the drive shaft to the end of the bearing and cut a spacer to fit the gap. Using a 3 8 socket head cap screw and two hard flat washers will prevent the drive shaft from coming out since it is now located against the inner race of the rear bearing. Also completed is the countersinking of the motor screw, but the video showing the countersinking seems to have been lost. Now with everything assembled, it is time to wake this thing up for the first time. This is a series wound DC motor where drive current goes through both the armature and field windings. I have a jumper connecting one of the armature terminals to one of the field terminals and two alligator clips going to a power source. I have a board wedged in between the motor and transmission bracket because the motor tensioner screw has not yet been installed. For my power source is a car battery charger I think I purchased over 35 years ago. Switch on and it's alive. It ran for about 30 there seconds before it kicked the circuit breaker off in the charger. My chipper shredder is alive. It's not enough power to chip or shred anything. But she's running.
And that's at about, uh, we're looking out here at the gauge. You can see the needle is pegged way over 10 amps. And it just blew the circuit breaker. So there we go. Now we're set up for the first actual battery power test. The battery that will be powering this is 48 volts and I'm expecting around 4000 RPM but the first test will be at only 12 volts. This is so I can gather preliminary motor characteristics and estimate its power requirements and RPM at 48 volts. Down here on the floor I've got two 6 volt batteries for my first test. The black box on the bench is a motor speed control rated to work from nominal 24 to 36 volts but it will not function at 12 volts. It will be used in the next test. After rearranging a few things on the bench I'm ready to power it up. Here we see a battery charger still connected to the batteries and charging at about 4 amps. To the right of the speed control I have one of my voltmeters monitoring the battery voltage. Since this motor speed controller will not function at 12 volts, I will have to short the two main terminals on the left side to start up the motor. And over to the right is my screwdriver on off switch and the tachometer. There is a reflective strip on the drive pulley and the tachometer projects a light onto the strip to measure the RPM. Grabbing the screwdriver, I short out the two terminals and off she goes and we can see we're holding it just over 12 volts on the meter. The tachometer shows I have just over 1100 RPM and a successful test. Now it is time to wire in another battery to run it at 18 volts. I am expecting to see the RPM increase between 400 and 500 RPM. Down here on the floor I now have three batteries wired in series for 18 volts for the next test. On the voltmeter I have 19 volts and this variable power supply will be used as a throttle signal for the speed controller which now functions at 18 volts. The throttle signal runs from 6 volts to 11 volts and should start seeing the motor rotate somewhere around 6.5 volts. It will be at full power when it gets to 10.8. Although the speed controller's minimum nominal voltage is 24 volts, it will operate at 18 volts because that is the voltage of a discharged 24 volt battery system. <coughs> this also allows me to power it up slowly. Slowly Three, increasing volts. the voltage on the power supply six and the motor and started at about 6.7 volts. It will be at full power when it reaches 10.8. Monitoring the RPM. We're at 800. After the first run it got to 1550 RPM and then I ran it up again to validate the test. Now I have to tear it all down to weld the shoulder for the rotor. For testing all that was needed was a collar and set screw and I am certain that will not be strong enough. <coughs> 
1560 RPM. The drive axle has been welded and now here she is fully assembled and out in the yard waiting for my rheostat for the full power testing. It will not be here for a few more days. The box it is sitting on is temporary and assuming it works will be replaced by the battery housing which also functions as a stand. I also plan on making a new handle because I have always thought that this handle is way too low making it difficult to pull around. And here's the basics on how the system is wired. Here in the middle is a representation of the motor controller. It has three small spade terminals which are for the throttle and power on signal. At the top there are two large power terminals for battery positive and negative. At the lower left is the negative output terminal to the motor. The motor return goes back to battery positive. The bottom right terminal on the controller will not be used in this application. Now I need to add basic controls to turn it on and off and for this I will be using a small contactor. The only contactor I have is rated at 24 volts so I will need to add a voltage dropping resistor to allow it to operate at 48 volts. Looking up the contactor specifications I find the coil resistance is 52 ohms with a pull in voltage of 13.2 volts. Now using ohms law to find the current needed. Amps equals voltage divided by resistance, so 24 volts divided by 52 ohms equals about 461 milliamps. Now I need to calculate a resistor that will give me a voltage no! drop of 24 volts at 461 milliamps. Since the 461 milliamps must also be flowing through the voltage dropping resistor, it would require a 52 ohm resistor, the same as the contactor. Watts equals voltage times current, so 24 volts times 461 milliamps equals 11.06 watts, but I don't have one of those. I do have a 10 watt 100 ohm resistor, so what will that do for me? The resistor and coil will be wired in series, so 52 ohms plus the 100 ohm resistor equals 152 ohms and at 48 volts the current will be 48 divided by 152 equals 316 milliamps. For the resistor voltage it is 100 ohms at 316 milliamps equals current times resistance equals 31.6 volts. 48 volt battery minus 31.6 volts across the resistor leaves me with 16.4 volts for the contactor which is above the pull-in voltage. I validated this using a voltmeter. Now I need to add some safety to control this machine. I have a main power switch for the contactor and I want to add another switch to enable the system. The small upper spade terminal is defined as a key switch input which turns the speed controller on. I will add another switch from this terminal to turn it on and the only thing left is throttle control. The throttle signal is 0 volts at start and ramps up to 5 volts at full power. Where am I going to get 5 volts? There are a few ways to get a reference 5 volt signal where the simplest is a simple voltage divider using a couple of resistors, but the voltage range of the battery does not make this practical. So I will be using a 5 volt Zener diode and a current limiting resistor. I measured the current into the KSI terminal and found it was about 2 milliamps, so that will decide what value resistor is needed. I will design at 5 milliamps limiting the current flowing through the diode. I also plan to put a capacitor across the diode to create a throttle ramp. The upper voltage of the battery will be around 52 volts, so 52 volts minus the Zener 5 volts leaves 47 volts across the resistor and at 5 milliamps, watts equals volts times amps or 5 milliamps times 47 equals 0.234 and I can use a 1 quarter watt resistor. For resistance, 
Ohms equals volts divided by current, so 47 divided by 0 .005 equals 9400 ohms, or the closest standard resistor is 9100. Since this machine will always be running at full power, another switch will be added that turns on the throttle ramp. The slope of the ramp will be determined by the capacitor across the diode. I will determine what value when testing for the first time. This completes the wiring for the system and now it's time to fabricate the battery bracket and a cover which will also house the wiring and switches. Be sure and subscribe to be notified when the next chapter is published.